it's been a long time coming. It was supposed to go out not long after we shot it, I think. And then there was problems uh, I heard because one of the one of the real guys, one of the real gang, was being brought up to trial on a different charge. So they'd all been caught, they'd all been arrested, they'd all been charged, they'd all been found guilty. But then uh, one of them was coming up for this for this trial for a previous crime, I think. I don't know all the details, but of course that held things up. They couldn't show it because it would have prejudiced his trial. I mean, God forbid anybody should have thought he was a thief. <laughs> But there we are, that's what happened. So, you know, we were all just uh, waiting to, to hear what was gonna be shown. And then finally, I think, when they caught na or nabbed Basil, that was the all clear, when he, got, uh, when he got charged and found guilty. I mean, we all knew at the time we were doing something special. Uh, you know, I've seen the other ones. I watched the other versions of it. And, and good as they are, I mean, I'm not knocking anybody's uh, take on it, but because I'd, done the other one because I'd read the script and knew about the background. I knew there was a lot of stuff they missed. I don't think they had the same access to the source material as Jeff Pope had. And I seem to remember that thinking when I saw it in the news what an audacious heist it was and how cleverly planned it had all been and how it all went off like clockwork. And that's all we knew. Um, and there was all this speculation I think in the press that it was they'd have to be really kind of well-built and, and muscled young guys who did this thing. So when you find out who it was, the surprise was extraordinary. I think it's maybe the wrong thing to think they were just a bunch of pensioners. I mean, you know, they were serious uh, professional criminals um, and, and, and they'd known each other, most of them had known each other for quite some time. And the job had taken a long time to plan. Nobody knows really how much, but it could have been up to 10 years in the planning. Uh, Brian Reader, who was the you know the kind of mastermind, if you like, behind the whole thing, <clears throat> had planned it meticulously, and the truth is they nearly got away with it. You tend to think, well, it's a, it's a victimless crime; nobody got hurt, and it was uh, jewels, and and a lot of people uh, didn't claim uh, because there was stuff in these safe deposit boxes that they didn't declare to the tax and all that. So they they, they just kind of kept quiet, and people were thinking, "Ah, good on you, mate." You know, but I think what's, what's important about, about our version of it is that it tells the story from different sides. It tells you know, our story, the gang, it tells a story about the people who were affected by that. And there was a lot of small businesses who kept the stuff stored in that, in that vault. And uh, because they, they assumed it was like ultra safe, they didn't have insurance. So people, businesses lost a lot of money, small, you know, who couldn't afford it. They weren't all like big, flashy diamond dealers. Uh, you know, he's not, he's not one of the cuddly granddads, although it's kind of grand upset to me. We spoke the other day and I said, you know, it's, it's, you know we're, we're, I'm glad they didn't do it as cuddly granddads. He said, he said, well, you're the cuddliest. He said, you know, if any was the cuddly, he said, you've got the cuddle factor. So Ken, Kenny's a, I don't want to say too much about Kenny uh, in case he doesn't like what I say about him and <laughs> makes a phone call. But he, he, doesn't, he doesn't come across as the sharpest pencil in the box, let's put it that way. But I think the reason that he was uh, involved in the job is because he was reliable. And Brian Reader had known him for a long time. And I think in that kind of world, uh, you know, you need people, if you're going to put a crew together, who you know are not going to blab. They're going to keep their mouths shut. They're professionals. I don't think Kenny was naive in any sense of the word. I mean, he was a professional villain, an old time villain. I don't think he was ever like really big time, but you know, he was, he was in his seventies and uh, you know, the, the, big, uh, the big jobs weren't gonna come along anymore. So this was his last big break. You know, he knew there was a lot of money involved and so he was prepared to do whatever it took to get it. But the fact was, you know, he was in his seventies. And as I say, you know, that affected him. And uh, you know, when you see him, he, he, he sits in his little office because they, they somehow or other managed to rent an office that overlooked uh, the vaults where the vaults were. And we filmed in the actual office. So I was sitting there as Kenny, looking out the window and thinking, this is where he was. He's, he actually, you know, this is the, and it's very exciting 
to do that sort of thing, to be on the actual location. I was quite glad I wasn't down there on the vault, really, because it was hot and sweaty and noisy with the drill gun and all that. No, I was quite happy to be up there as Kenny, having a wee snooze to myself and eating a banana. I think, I think if I'd gone through the hole, I'd be there yet. I'd be stuck halfway through with the legs wiggling out. No, when I started to kind of look into to playing him, um, I have a friend who's uh, in Islington. He's a, I can't say too much, he's a bit of an ex-bad lad, let's put it that way, uh, who knows a lot of people and he knew some of the guys in this and he knew Kenny. So he gave me some kind of background detail about him and what he was like. And I think, you know, the way I play him, he comes off rather well. I don't think he's that, you know, that, a nice guy by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but you know, I, I don't play him as, as Mr. Bad Guy too much. Uh, so I, that, that was my research really, was, was talking to my, my chum down at, uh, uh, in the Islington market. <laughs> the, the actors pray, but just before they go on stage, actors say, oh God, don't let me up, right? <laughs> So my prayer was, oh God, don't let me sound like Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins. <laughs> no, it's, we work cheap. <laughs> We're cheaper than English actors. We'll do anything. It's right. revenge. I, I thought about it, I thought, I, I did think, I actually did think, am I right for this? Should I really be doing this? You know, is this the right thing to do? There's plenty of, you know, Cockney actors around. Um, or actors who, you know, can do that sort of East End accent. And then I thought, nah, to hell, you know what? It's revenge. It's revenge for all the English actors who play Scottish, you know, with terrible Scottish accents. So I've got my own back at last. To be part of the team was almost like being part of the gang. Because I'd worked with Tim Spall before, I'd worked with Ken Craner before, and obviously worked with David Heyman. So we all kind of knew each other. So in a sense, it was sort of like the real gang, you know, we were these kind of old guys getting back together again to do this job. But we were we were only acting it. So it was great to be with them because you have a kind of a, a, a relaxed familiarity and we all got on very well with each other and we all kind of liked each other's work. So in a sense, you know, it was a kind of doppelganger, you know, a mirror image of the, of the real gang. Well, one of my favorite moments was not so much during the filming, but it was before we started filming because we had the great privilege of being taken down into the real vault the actual vault. And the thing is that it's, to my, much to my surprise, they didn't clear it up. It's exactly as it was left after the robbery because the, you know, the, the security had been broached so nobody could use it again. They couldn't uh, reuse it as a secure vault. So they didn't do anything. And everything's exactly as they left. So the whole stone wall? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Try it, try it out. He did, he got through. Yeah, he was the first to try it out. Uh, I just looked at it and walked through the door that was open. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll pass on that. There's probably scenes that I wasn't involved in that I haven't seen that would be wonderful. But the bits that I have seen that in the bank vault were well, actually doing the job. And I know that these scenes are pretty much authentic. Pretty much exactly as they did it. I think the tension in there of these guys in this, this vault because they were outside the vault to start with, you know, drilling through the wall and the tension of realising that they, they can't do it. Uh, again, I don't want to give away too much, but uh, they, they walk away. They walk away from the job and then they make the fatal mistake, or some of them make the fatal mistake of going back to finish it. My favourite moment was doing the quick getaway in the van. They were going to get a stunt driver and I said, actually, you know what? <laughs> I like to do this myself. And they were kind of, oh, no, well, um, um, should we have a wee practice? So we had a wee practice with it at you know, a reasonably slow speed because I had to do a, 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 a I mean, screech away, the whole screechy tire thing, you know, ah, yes. <laughs> screech away, do a U turn, and then top speed down the street. And I think the reason they were really worried about it because the rest of the cast in the back of the van, you know, I was responsible for all that. But we did it. And it, actually, it's, it's probably. Probably just as well that they weren't actually recording the sound on that bit because all you could hear from inside the van was, Whoa! God, oh, what the bloody hell! I really went for it and it was great. I mean, my heart was gone when we finally stopped. There are surprises in this because that's what 
when I, when, I, when I saw the other ones, the other versions of it, there was stuff that they'd missed, which I think is very important and kind of jaw dropping. When you find out what happened uh, with the loot and how, because the, the thing is, it wasn't, you know, it's not just a question as I realized of, of just stealing the stuff. You have to dispose of it. And so Brian Reader had all that planned out. He knew uh, the right people to get it to, the right person to get that stuff to. But when the job went slightly wrong, it went very, very wrong. And they started, you know, getting people, other people involved who they shouldn't have been messing with at all. The great thing about being a four part series is that it can take its time to really tell the story of, of how it progressed, how they got caught. And I, none of the other versions really got close to the truth. And I think the truth is fascinating. Just how little things start to go wrong and little boulders start to roll down the hill and dislodge other boulders and then the whole avalanche starts. In a way, it was Kenny's fault, I suppose. In a way, but no more than the rest of them. You know, nobody said, Kenny, don't take your car when we go and get this jack. He just did as he was told. We'll pick it up in your car. But maybe if he parked a couple of streets away, <laughs> they might not have connected the, you know, the tool shop with a car, with a car number plate. These two big wheelie bins come in and they weigh a ton. Uh, you know, because gold bars are obviously made of gold, but they're still heavy metal. So the things got wheeled in and appended on my carpet. And you see it, it's like, it's like Pirates of the Caribbean. You know, they're like pirates and there's the loot, there's the treasure. They've just opened the treasure chest. The amount of stuff that was there. And then they, they sort of kick into professional mode. They have to go through it because they have to sort out the values. So they sit there, you know, with jeweler's eyeglasses <laughs> evaluating it. This, this, I mean, it's like, you know, it's unbelievable when you see it. You realize just how much they got away with. There's so much of the loot that was never recovered. I mean, a lot, serious amount of, squillions uh, that are still out there. Now obviously somebody knows where they are and probably more than one of them knows where the stuff is and the police haven't got the resources to keep tabs on them once they're released from prison. They can watch them for a bit but they can't watch them forever. So I think there's another story yet to be told about how they get their hands on the rest of that stuff. Where do you think it is? Think <laughs> if I knew you think I'd be sitting here, <laughs> I'd be out there with a shovel. <laughs> Never been nicked for anything. Uh, no, I, I, there's no story there, sadly. No, 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 sadly at all, what am I talking about? No, I, I, I've had a couple of uh, experiences of, of, the, of the law, uh, but nothing being nicked. And there was a time, it was back in the 70s, and my pal Brian Pettifer, who used to be a rap scene as, but you know, we were pals for years and years since we were boys together. And we went down to London at the time, it was the kind of late 60s early 70s and military jackets had just come in people wore military jackets not in glasgow i have to say but in london and we went down to uh, king's road i think it was a uh, portobello road and got a couple of these scarlet kind of military jackets with buttons and <laughs> wore them in glasgow and we were walking across uh, across uh, george square one saturday you know cock of the walk proudest bunch with these things on heads were turning and these guys come up this bunch of guys come up and said give us the jackets and we were like, no. And one of them opened his, his uh, coat and he'd have sword stuck in his trousers. He said, give us his jackets. And at the, well, no, because at the corner of my eye, I saw a big cop standing not far away. And I grabbed Brian, I said, Brian, run. And we ran towards this, this big polis and they stayed put. And we got up to the polis. I said, those, those, those guys, those, they, they, were, they, wanted, they were going to steal our, our clothes and, and they got, one of them had a big sword and, and they were going to rob us and stab us. And he looked at us and said, what do you expect dressed like that? Walked away, left us to the fate he felt me so richly deserved. <laughs>